Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the first plenary session of our conference, Immigration Recasting the Debate. My name is Peter Civellis, Associate Professor of Political Science and one of the co-organizers of this event. We're delighted that you're here. It's wonderful to see so many people here and to see that we also have some, a lot of familiar faces from the community, so welcome to Wake Forest. This is the first event of the 2006-2007 Voices of Our Time series, an initiative of our president, Nathan Hatch. Voices of Our Time is envisioned as a program to provide a crossroads for the exploration of local, national, and global issues through prominent speakers and challenging discussions. During this conference, we intend to have just such a discussion. The very nature of the immigration issue ensures a challenging and engaging dialogue for the next three days. Immigration is a topic that elicits a good deal of emotion and charged debate that often obscures facts, which in turn gets in the way of good policy making. Our goal here is twofold. First, to provide attendees sound data on which to base their political decisions and to provide a civil forum for the debate and discussion of potential solutions to the many challenges raised by immigration. We hope you all will actively and enthusiastically participate in this debate with us. After the plenary remarks tonight, we'll have a question and answer session for just such participation. It's now my pleasure to introduce to you our president, Nathan Hatch. Thank you, Peter, and thanks to all of you for your presence tonight as we begin to explore this complex but very important issue. We have a rare opportunity over the next three days to educate ourselves about what is a major challenge facing all Americans today and in the future. We also have the rich opportunity to learn from and with eminent scholars, government leaders, and leaders in the Hispanic community. We expect to hear excellent questions, lively debate, and potential steps that this nation can take to resolve not only the political quandary around immigration issues, but also the negative impact on human lives that is caused by our country's indecision about the issue of immigration. Indeed, immigration in a land of immigrants is a topic that speaks to the very heart of what we as individuals believe about a critical char characteristic of America's heritage. I'm most grateful to Dr. Peter Savalas and Dr. David Coates of our political science department who designed this symposium and have worked di diligently to assemble the suburb panelists from whom you will be hearing. As a university, Wake Forest understands its obligation to share with our greater community thoughtful explorations of questions that are important to all of us. Our keynote speaker tonight brings great experience as a scholar and presidential advisor. Ray Marshall earned his doctorate in economics at the University of California and is, has been a specialist in labor and economic policy. He is author and co-author of more than 30 books and 200 articles. He served as Secretary of Labor in the administration of Jimmy Carter. His article, Getting Immigration Reform Right, was re recently published in the journal Challenge. He holds the Audrey and Bernard Rappaport Centennial Chair in Economics and Public Affairs at the University of Texas, Austin, and is president of Ray Marshall Incorporated, a research and consulting firm. We are honored to have him with us to officially open our conference. I am pleased to present Dr. Ray Marshall. Thank you. Well, thank you, President Hatch. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'd like to uh, congratulate the organizers of this conference. Uh, this is an extremely important subject uh, that we're uh, trying to grapple with and to shed, shed some light on. It is complex, highly controversial. Uh, it is the most difficult policy issue that I have ever tried to uh, work with. Uh, but it is, it is also one of the most important 
issues that I've had to work with. And I think that uh, conferences like this can uh, be very useful in building consensus for the kinds of policies that will be compatible uh, with our values and our national interest. Uh, I speak, I come to this subject as an economist. I probably ought not to confess that uh, because uh, economists don't agree on a lot. I guess it was George Bernard Shaw said if you laid all economists end to end, they'd never reach a conclusion. And somebody recently told me if we laid you all in the end, it'd be a good idea. <laughs> and I think, uh, though, on this subject, economists agree more on the facts than they do on the policies, as they would agree uh, to much of what I am telling you, except uh, they would depart uh, some from interpretations and recommendations. Uh, I have been working on immigration all of my professional life. I had responsibility for, the, uh, for immigration in the Carter administration. Uh, at that time, uh, we felt that we had to get a handle on uh, illegal immigration because it had reached maybe two million. Uh, and then by the time the, the uh, Immigration and Refugee Control Act uh, of 1986 was passed, uh, the number had gone from three to six. Uh, today, the estimate is from 12 to 20. So it seems to me to be some urgency for us to get a handle on uh, immigration. Uh, we created this, the Select Commission on Immigration and Refugee Policy, uh, and uh, it issued reports that led to the 1986 Act. I tried to shape that act uh, unsuccessfully uh, because the political forces would not allow uh, what seemed to be, uh, to me at any rate, to be a sensible solution to it. What I'd like to do is three things. One, uh, to say some things about the importance of the immigration issue and immigration as a phenomenon uh, to the United States and secondly, to talk about some of the problems that we now have in uh, immigration policy or the lack of it. And then uh, to outline what seemed to me to be uh, the kinds of comprehensive policies that uh, might deal successfully with the problem uh, if we could get it done. Let me talk first about the importance. I'll take first the economic importance. The reality is that the United States, in order to grow, must have immigration. The main reason for that is that there will be zero net increase in prime working age natives for the next 20 years. That's related to the retirement of the baby boom generation, uh, which was about 80 million people, and their successor generation uh, had about uh, uh, 35 million people less than the uh, previous generation, that is, than the baby boomers themselves. Uh, immigration during the 1950s accounted for about half of the growth of our workforce. Uh, between 2000 and 2006, it accounted for 86% of the growth in employment. So it's already a, a very important part of our economy. Uh, the second aspect of uh, immigration is that it has contributed to the dynamism of the American economy. I believe you can make a strong case that the future belongs to the creative. It will not be to the people who produce standardized things are people who do routine work. In order for the United States and for Americans to continue to have a relatively high standard of living, we've got to produce things that other people don't produce or can't produce as well. And that's uh, one of the reasons I think we lead in, in uh, creativity uh, is because we are a diverse, we're a nation of immigrants. 
uh, where ideas uh, are changed uh, all of the time and therefore able to create uh, new ideas, to see that which can only be seen in the mind's eye. Other countries have not been able to do that as well. A third aspect, the economic aspect, is that uh, the immigrant population to a very significant degree is complementary to the American economy and workforce. And by that I mean, as an example, the only way we're going to be able to preserve our social security system and our pay-as-you-go pension systems is to have a lot of young workers coming into the workforce in order to pay pensions because we're on a pay-as-you-go system. Immigrants helped a lot with that, and that's a positive aspect of, of immigration for, uh, for the uh, country. There are, however, some negatives uh, that need to be weighed against those. Uh, the negatives come, I think, largely from the fact that we have so many unauthorized uh, immigrants in the United States, uh, and also because we do not do a very good job of administering our foreign worker laws. We don't uh, do a very good job of protecting either the, the uh, foreign workers or American workers from their competition. Economists agree on one thing. If the foreign workers are complementary to American workers, they are generally positive, have positive impact. In other words, if uh, you, you bring in uh, workers who work with, skill, with skilled craftsmen, those laborers will improve the productivity of the whole work. Wherever you can get complementarity, uh, you can get improvements in productivity. Uh, unfortunately, uh, many of the illegal immigrants who come in are competitive with our low-wage workers, and therefore they depress their wages and uh, tend to displace uh, many of those workers. Another negative is that the uh, undocumented workers themselves are easily exploited, risk grave dangers in order to get here, uh, and uh, they, are, they have to depart from their families, and therefore uh, that is a negative from the workers' perspective. It's also hard within the framework of a lot of illegal immigration to relate immigration to your other, e other policies, to your economic policies, your social policies, and your national security policies because you, you don't control the flow and you don't know uh, what the characteristics of the people are likely to be. And that uh, is a, a very serious problem. One of the basic problems that we face in trying to have a productive and creative workforce is education. Uh, the uh, foreign-born immigrant population in the United States uh, is bimodal. There's a few uh, workers at the top are very well educated, better well educated than natives, but most are not. And one of the best measures of that is the national and international literacy surveys. Literacy surveys are more accurate in a lot of ways than years of schooling because the literacy survey is a performance test. It's what, what do you know how to do? And uh, what we found is that uh, the immigrants coming into the United States, foreign born people in the United States, are at the first, a majority are at the first of five literacy levels, and only about 10% are at the four or five. And our foreign-born have lower literacy scores than the foreign-born in other rich countries. Now, what that means is that if, if it is true, as I believe it is, that we need to have a well-educated workforce, then we have to be concerned about educating the, an adult education system for uh, foreign-born. But let me also s emphasize that the depressing effects on wages and working conditions is not entirely at the low-wage end of the scale. 
uh, it was originally, originally I mean back going back into the 1980s and 90s, but now uh, the people who have begun to get, uh, have declining real wages are college educated workers. Uh, the, the college educated workers, uh, only, only college educated workers who are better off today than they were in 2000 are po people with postgraduate professional degrees and PhDs. And that's 3.4% of the workforce. The other college graduates are worse off. Now, immigration accounts for part of that uh, because, but that system is uh, the temporary foreign worker programs, L1, H1B, uh, and the main reason that that system is not doing as well as it should is because the law is not being enforced. That is to say, uh, the, the, the federal government allows uh, college-educated people from other countries to undercut wages and working conditions in the United States and don't rigorously enforce it. Uh, now, of course, the other main reason is that college work, knowledge work, is a lot easier to outsource than manufacturing. In a study I just, uh, my organization just completed, we studied engineers. And we found that a beginning engineer in the United States makes $45,000 a year. A beginning engineer in India makes $7,500 a year. If you can transfer that work on a computer, it's a click of a mouse. It's not hard to tell uh, where that work will get done. So part of what's happening is immigration, but part of it at the high wage end of the scale uh, is also because of uh, the, the fact that college people who do routine work uh, are at risk in a global society where the cost of communications has plummeted. And it's plummeted for two reasons. One is because China has become the chief exporter of information technology at very low cost. The other was the collapse of the uh, high-tech bubble uh, and therefore to collapse the prices of, of that technology so that now the, the labor market has become globalized. You also, it's important to note that the world's labor market doubled when China, India, and Eastern Europe entered the world trading system. And therefore, that kind of competition is something we have to be terribly concerned about, is how do you deal with that? Now, that's the economic aspects of it. Let me say a bit about the political importance of immigration. Uh, one of the problems with unauthorized immigration is it undermines the rule of law. In a society that believes in the rule of law, that's troubling. A second political aspect is that the Latino population and immigrant populations generally are becoming very important politically. Uh, they're, they're important for a couple of reasons, or three reasons. One is that they're strategically located. They're in those places where Democrats and Republicans have to contend uh, for dominance. Uh, and the future of many states, including Texas, California, Florida, and much of the Intermountain West, uh, will be determined to some degree about which party is able to get the Hispanic vote. George Bush got elected president because he, among the Republicans, was able to do it able to raise that his percentage uh, to uh, almost 40 percent. And uh, they lost, the Republicans lost the Congress uh, during the, in 2006, because th their proportion fell back uh, and they were unable to get, uh, that. of course there were many other reasons besides that, but that was an important factor. Third, national unity uh, depends heavily on how we assimilate foreigners into our midst. Uh, national disunity is a serious political and economic problem. It means you will not be able to resolve most of your basic problems politically. 
if, you're, uh, if you have national unity. If you look around the world at places and p countries that are doing well, it's because they've been able to have national unity. Now, we can have all the benefits of immigration uh, if we avoid the defects, the, the disadvantages, which is the need to uh, develop national unity and fairness uh, in our dealings with people. The countries that do not assimilate their foreign born will have national disunity. Very few uh, countries give conscious weight uh, to doing that. It's also extremely important to note that immigration has important foreign policy implications. And one of my objections to what we've, uh, much of the debate is that they have ignored that. Uh, they, they, they assume that all this takes place within the United States. The United States has to be very concerned about what happens in Mexico and in the rest of this region. Uh, it is in our, to our advantage for Mexicans to develop a, a, an economy that can provide broadly shared prosperity for all their people. They're not likely to do that anytime soon. We, therefore, the, in fact, the foreign minister of Mexico told us in 1978 that whatever you do, you will absorb a large part of the Mexican population growth. Now, I didn't want to believe that. I believed, being naive, that we could do something about that. But he was right. We absorbed a large part of their population growth. Now, it's important to Mexico and for several reasons. One, it's a safety valve. They cannot provide good jobs uh, for all the people coming into their workforce, about a million a year in recent decades. Uh, they can, in a good year, they can provide three or 400,000 jobs for people. A million is beyond their capability right now. They have structural defects in that economy that make that practically impossible to have. Mexicans are worse off now in relative terms than they were before the NAFTA was passed or than they were in the 1950s in uh, real income terms. So without that safety valve, uh, Mexico would have a lot of trouble. Uh, the downside of that is as long as they've got the safety valve, they have less motive to concentrate on making the structural adjustments that they need to make in their court system, their economy, their uh, uh, justice system. Uh, secondly, remittances from, from Mexicans living abroad are the second most important foreign source of foreign exchange for Mexico, second only to oil. And the way oil is going, remittances could become first uh, because Mexico is not making its oil industry competitive and efficient. A third is that the way Mexico can influence the U.S. policy uh, and what, in fact, any national group, uh, any uh, uh, country, through its nationals within the United States, can frequently have more impact on U.S. policy than they can through dem uh, diplomatic circles. And therefore, this is an important part of that. Finally, a political thing of we should be very concerned about is national security. Uh, uh, you can overestimate that, you can underestimate it, and both of them are dangerous uh, because we do have a serious national security problem and it's bound up with how we deal with immigration. Now, despite uh, the importance of the subject, we actually have very poor immigration policies in the country. In fact, a, one, a judge in Texas some years ago said our immigration policy is an amiable fiction. And I think that's probably the best way to put it. You know, we, uh, why is that? Well, the only people who have a lot of trouble with our system are people who try to do things legally. You know, if you try to get into the country, it might take you over 20 years to get in legally. You, uh, the, the backlog uh, for entry, it's cumbersome that our worker adjustment programs that I was uh, responsible for, the foreign worker programs, uh, don't meet the legitimate needs of workers or employers. 
Uh, the other problem, of course, is that we simply have not been able to gain control with present policies of illegal immigration uh, because it continues to uh, increase. The, and the work authorization system is not uh, very effective. Now, part of the blame for that I lay to the 1986 law uh, that I was involved in uh, trying to get passed. There were several big problems with that that we ought to learn from. One is that you're not going to deal with the immigration problem or deal with uh, unauthorized immigration unless you have a foolproof identifier. Uh, uh, the security, doc the documents uh, have to be secure. We, my colleagues and I developed one that was secure, but we couldn't get it accepted. The reason we couldn't is that the ACLU didn't want to have an identifier and the employers didn't want to control illegal immigration. So when they teamed up, it became practically impossible to get an identifier. Now, uh, my argument with the ACLU is that I have never considered that my liberty is diminished because I can identify myself. It might be diminished if you could deny me the identifier. Now, with 9-11 and with the uh, uh, information technology and the security technology, biotech uh, controls, uh, I think we've got a lot better chance to do that. But we didn't do it. A second problem with IRCA is they gave employers the responsibility for verifying these documents. Now, why the, uh, the, the problem with that requirement is the employers had neither the will or the means to verify the documents. Uh, they want to hire the undocumented workers, and, you, and then we invited fraud by making a lot of, uh, an array of documents uh, available to be used for the employee to verify. And in many flea markets, I don't know what it's like in North Carolina, but in Austin, Texas, we can buy you any kind of documents you want uh, out on the uh, highway at a flea market. And there's a thriving business in that. Well, we're not going to deal with the problem as long as we have those two requirements. Now, a third thing, reason that Erica didn't do it, and that you won't do it this time, is because it did not deal with the fundamental problem, as it didn't understand the, the, the crux of the problem. And in my judgment, the crux of the problem is that you get a strong bond between employers and the undocumented workers. The undocumented workers are desperate. A bad job here looks good to them. They have few options. They've risked a great deal to get here. Uh, the employer, on the other hand, many employers prefer the undocumented workers because they work for less and they'll work harder. And once you, find, once you understand that and the networks that get built up as a result of that, if you don't find a way to strike at that strong bond, uh, you're not going to effectively deal with the problem. And uh, that all of us, uh, most of us at any rate, uh, have contributed to those networks because partly of sympathy for people who are only trying to improve their conditions. They want to crack at the American standard of living, the American way, and there's a great deal of sympathy for that. And they tend to be hardworking, and therefore many groups sympathize with them. They're, the networks are also perpetuated by some myths that, like all myths, have some ver some. Uh, uh, reality associated with them. One of the most enduring of these myths is that the foreign workers only take jobs that Americans won't take. There are several things wrong with it. One thing that's the, 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 the uh, validity of that is that it is true that Americans with options uh, will shun undesirable work. You know, they, but they will take hard jobs and do 
American workers work very hard. There's no job at the national level that's held entirely by immigrants. You get some at the local level that are held entirely by immigrants, but there are no jobs that under the right conditions Americans won't take. There are several other uh, reasons to doubt that myth. One is that if the relationship between the, as if the employer's preference freezes out domestic workers, then you make it a self-fulfilling prophecy that domestic workers will not take those jobs. They can't get them. And there wouldn't be much they could do uh, to be able to get it. Another reality is the employers have other options. They don't just have to hire people who have to work scared and hard. They can do a number of things. They can recruit, make an active effort to recruit uh, domestic workers to do that work. They're reluctant to do it if there's a ready support. And I've worked in this, and I've recruited it for them they, that they said you couldn't find workers to do. And I never failed to find workers to do the jobs that they said that couldn't be done. It takes some work. I put the employment service in charge of recruiting workers before I would certify the foreign workers to come in. Employers didn't like that, uh, but we were able to, to do it. Second thing they could do is to improve management. Many of these low-wage jobs are very poorly managed. And the reason they can be so poorly managed is they can shift all the cost of inefficiency to the workers through piece rate systems and other ways to organize the work. That's what my friends in the Texas citrus industry did until we worked out a, a better way to do it. You could also mechanize. There's nothing wrong with that. And by the work, you know, the other thing you could do is raise wages and benefits to make these jobs more attractive, but they're uh, unlikely and uh, unwilling to do that. The other part of the problem is that the employer's standards for the job, they will say Americans won't do the job. That's not what they mean. They mean that Americans won't do the job as well as these foreign workers can do it. That's not a legitimate standard. The legitimate standard is can Americans meet minimum work standards? And the answer is that if they're reasonable standards, uh, they can do that. It is not legitimate to allow f uh, employers to cream the for foreign worker crops of workers and then have American families compete with them. Now, uh, a second one of these myths is that unauthorized immigration is not a problem, really, because in the aggregate, its impacts are very small and probably positive. Most economists, uh, mainstream economists, take that view. Uh, and to some degree, it's true. As, as I mentioned, the foreign workers tend to complement the American workforce, but not entirely. And some of our most vulnerable workers have been most damaged uh, by the competition uh, from the unauthorized workers. And this is especially true of people with less than high school educations. Uh, it's true that the, the workers with less than high school started losing their real wages in the 1970s. And then skilled workers started losing real wages. And since 2000, college-educated workers, uh, real wages have been stagnant or declining. Now, it's, it is also true that immigration is not the only factor, but it is a factor. Another myth that I think perpetuates these networks is the argument that uh, the uh, undocumented workers improve the competitiveness of the American economy. Now, whether that's true or not depends on what you mean by competitiveness. If you mean they reduce wages, then that's true. If, however, you mean that they, we compete by raising productivity, which is, I think, the only really effective way to compete, uh, then it's not true. 
and it, it becomes very important which one of these ways to compete you, ex you adopt. You will lose wage competition. There are always countries with lower wages. We're losing jobs to Mexico, and Mexico is losing jobs to China. The Chinese have lower wages even uh, than the Mexicans. So I would say if you want to compete by improving productivity and standards of living, immigration can contribute to that if it's complementary to the American economy. It won't if all that it does is to reduce wages. Now, let me uh, go to the last part of my presentation. What should we do about all of this? Uh, I think one of the most important things, to, first thing, is to think uh, strategically, to base our policy on sound, factual, and analytical bases, uh, which we have not done. And when you, you need to understand that what the forces are that affect immigration, both in the sending countries like Mexico and in the receiving countries like the United States. I, by thinking strategically, I mean take into consideration that these other countries are changing just as we are. The Mexican population growth is slowing down. In future decades, it will be about half of what it is now. And therefore, you cannot assume that it will continue to be uh, a million a year. Similarly, we cannot assume that Indian wages will continue to be lower than American wages. Indian wages are rising. Chinese wages are rising. So you have to think strategically about that. There's one thing everybody agrees on, and that is that our, our wages and theirs will converge in a competitive market. The real question is, how? Will they converge by ours coming down and theirs coming up, which I think is not a happy outcome, or will it converge by theirs increasing faster than ours, and therefore everybody being better off? That scenario is possible, but you have to have a strategy to cause it to happen. Now, a, a second uh, one of these kind of background issues that, gets, that get ignored is that when we develop any kind of policy, we need to think about the capability of the executive branch of government to implement the policy. They didn't do that with the 1986 immigration. They had no idea at all about whether there was a mechanism that could implement that uh, reform. If you don't do that, then you might as well not do it because you'll get a lot of confusion and you'll get a lot of illegal activity. Now, what do you need to do if you want to get the executive branch uh, organized to deal with immigration? First thing I would recommend is that the president appoint a special assistant for immigration to give it greater visibility. In our system, if the president doesn't pay any attention to it, it won't happen much. You also need to pay attention to what's happening between the departments. Several of our departments have responsibility for immigration, but they don't necessarily work with each other at all. That ought to happen. One of the most important things I think needs to happen is that we need to create an independent agency on immigration and foreign workers to, to get the facts, to understand the trends, and to make recommendations to the Congress about immigration, how many people should we let in, and what categories, how, which ones, what effect would it have on uh, different parts of our policy. The way it happens now is that the Congress goes through its mechanism, and it may or may not come up with any kind of solution that makes any sense. And recently, they haven't. In other words, they were going to let a whole lot more engineers in, foreigners, and in, in the Senate bill than the total employment among those engineers uh, in the future. Well, that's completely unrealistic, but a, an independent agency would be able to deal with that. Now, 
Uh, this, so I think that's the thing. Now, the components of a, an effective immigration policy, I think, would be the following. One, secure documents. Now, I've said enough about that. That can be done. Second, employer sanctions. But give the employer an easy defense. As all the employer ought to have to do is to see if you've got that secure document. And the system we developed, all the employer would have to do is call an 800 number and put it in, put the confirmation number just like you do with your credit cards. And uh, that would be the complete uh, uh, responsibility of an employer. We should not ask employers to verify these documents. We need to have strong, smart border controls and uh, visa enforcement policies. But you need to understand that just border controls are not going to deal with the problem because a large proportion of the people who are in the country uh, unauthorized uh, came with visas. And if you stop the border, you can be sure that more will come. And if you don't strike at the basic causes, uh, you have great difficulty. I think you can do that and should. The most, one of the most controversial things is my fourth one, adjust the status of eligible unauthorized immigrants in the United States. Uh, that is controversial for a variety of reasons. It's also the trickiest to make work. If you don't do it right, it will be counterproductive as it was in 1986. You will accelerate the flow. If you don't signal that this is the last time we're going to do it. Second, you have to have a carefully orchestrated combination of carrots and sticks in order to make people come out of the shadows and into the mainstream of American life. The stick, uh, the, the, the carrot would be uh, that you would have a simple path to earned legal status in the United States. The carrot would be, if you don't come forth, there's a high probability that you will not be able to get a good job and that you will be deported. And without a combination of carrots and sticks, it's not likely to work. Now, the biggest objection to that, to adjusting the status of undocumented workers, undocumented immigrants, generally, is the argument that it's rewarding illegal behavior. Well, that obviously is the case. The, 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 the behavior was illegal. But if you, if you were in the position of the immigrants and saw that the law was ignored, was not being enforced, that a lot of people wanted you to be in the powerful people, wanted you to be in the United States, and that includes the Mexican government, the IRS, many states, unions, many community groups, banks, were all co-conspirators. It'd be hard to for an immigrant to believe that only they are culpable. And that this was, now, if we had had a law that met the requirements of a good law, we would be on sounder grounds condemning the immigrants. A good law must be transparent, which ordinarily means simple, so that anybody can understand it. It must be fair, and it must be enforceable. And the 1986 Immigration Act did not meet uh, those standards. Uh, the fifth thing that I would do yeah, it would be to improve the operation of temporary worker programs that we have in the, in the country now. As I've mentioned, uh, there's a lot that we can do to make them a lot more efficient. And I think we ought to give high priority to that. We, we could cause them to more efficiently meet the needs of employers and do it in a timely way and protect the wages and working conditions of domestic workers and the foreign workers. All you have to have is a strategy uh, to cause that to happen. But it requires some imaginative regulation and implementation. We can recertify, we can pre-certify a lot of employers. 
if they're willing to observe standards and protocols. That would greatly facilitate that. The second thing you could do is induce as much self-regulation. A good kind of self-regulation is an agreement between an employer's association and workers' organizations, as is being done now uh, by the uh, Farm Worker Organizing Committee and by United Farm Workers. You would police that system to be sure that they weren't involved in any uh, uh, illegal or underhanded activity. You'd have audits periodically in order to be able to do that. A sixth thing that I would is a negative, I would not have a large new guest worker program. First, I believe it's unnecessary. Uh, if we need foreign workers, they should either come in under our restructured temporary worker program with all the protections that they could get. Uh, we should protect them by allowing them to change employers. They should, be, they should have all of the rights of American workers and we should rigorously enforce our labor laws to see that that happens. I had a program when I was Secretary of Labor, Employers of Undocumented Workers Program, and what we did was to take the exploitation out of that, and we greatly improved uh, the incomes of those people uh, involved. Now, if after we, did, after we had comprehensive reform, we decided that we needed more workers. They ought to come in one of three categories, more immigrants. If, I, if my independent agency said that we've looked at the evidence, we need X number of people in these categories, and we will always, of course, have a large number in, for the uniting of families, then they would come in in one of three categories, temporary workers with their rights protected and with American workers protected, by not permitting them to depress wages and working conditions. Secondly, provisional workers. There's people who come in uh, and have the right to earn permanent status, and then the third, permanent status with the right to earn citizenship. Uh, we are, why not have guest workers? You know, I asked my colleagues in the OECD uh, during the 1970s, many of them had guest worker programs, I said, how many of you, if you had it to do over again, would have a guest worker program? Nobody would. Why? You cannot, in a democracy, have people with permanent second-class status. You cannot have an underclass. It will cause you trouble. Maybe not with the, the first generation, but you can be sure that you'll have trouble with their children which is what's happening a good bit in Europe now. So we're, my, my belief is we're much better off with uh, permanent residents and, and citizens than we are with guest workers. Now finally, we ought to do some things uh, to strike at the source of a lot of the illegal immigration in the United States. We should work with Canada and other countries in this hemisphere uh, through trade, investment, and aid uh, to have Mexico in a healthy development pattern, which they're not likely to get otherwise. The best pattern for that uh, is what they did in Europe. So they thought in Europe when they got unified that you were going to get a flood of immigrants coming out of Portugal, Spain, Ireland uh, into Europe, uh, and they were worried about that. So what they did was to create a social fund, they called it, to help develop Ireland, Portugal, and Spain. And the, 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 the flood of immigrants that were expected never materialized. But if you've, ever, if you've been to Spain, Portugal, and Ireland recently, you'll notice that those are booming places and are developing very well. There's no reason Mexico could not be a well-developed, democracy, uh, but it has to make some structural changes. I would give special attention to developing the lagging re regions in Mexico from which uh, many of the undocumented workers come. I would give special attention to education. Uh, education in Mexico is not good. 
uh, one of the ways we could give aid that would be beneficial to them and us would be a Marshall Plan uh, to try to improve the education of, in the elementary and secondary schools, uh, and especially of women, because the best way to break the intergenerational patterns of poverty is to educate the women. And we've learned that from all over the country, help develop their infrastructure, improve their court and justice system, corruption, is a serious problem, a serious impediment to development in uh, Mexico. And I think uh, that what we could do if we wanted to try to, we can't tell Mexico what to do. We shouldn't try. We've tried it too much. But what we can do is to use our aid, investment, trade programs to leverage these reforms. And it, because they're in their interest and our interest too. Now, in conclusion, you know, I hope this conference can build support, maybe not for this list of, uh, of policies, but for some uh, that will be effective in uh, causing in, uh, our immigration policies to be compatible with our interests and our values. Uh, it would be hard for me to imagine something that's more important to the nation's future than that. Thank you.